This is the Second Studio Design and Architecture Podcast hosted by two architects, myself, David Lee, and Marina Bordaronet. The two of us are partners and co-founders of the Architecture and Interdesign Office Fame, Architecture and Interdesign. And today we're talking about five tips for hiring the right architect, also known as five questions to ask the architects you are interviewing, the five professionals you are interviewing. This subject and these five points came up because through our office, we get approached pretty often uh, by clients who are already in the process of their home project. They already have an architect or professional, and they're a little bit way through, halfway through, or even further, and they're getting into trouble, and they reach out to us and say, I don't feel like what's happening is correct. This is not what I expected. I don't know what to do. Is this normal? What should I do? How can you help me? SOS. SOS, exactly. So these five questions are really kind of the common patterns and things that we've seen come up. And I think if, if folks, if clients ask these five questions before they hired the individual, it would have avoided them a lot of headache, stress, and obviously wasted money and time. And miscommunication, maybe. Mm, yeah. Miscommunication, yeah. for sure. If you're a client and you're trying to build a new home or a significant remodel and you want to hire someone to design it for you, one of the first questions you should ask is what is this person's experience? And it's a common question. And most commonly, clients will ask it within the the context of what is your project experience? Have you done projects that were are of a similar size, scope, nature, and style? So if I'm doing a 6,000 square foot home, new home in this location, okay, professional, have you done 6,000 square foot homes in the past in this rough vicinity uh, of this approximate budget and also the the kind of aesthetics I'm looking for. Like I want a white box house versus traditional. Have you done the one that I'm looking for to do? Well, and I think it's a valid question and probably the most obvious, right? Like you want to make sure that the person you hire is going to provide you with what you're looking for. So therefore, you're looking for the person who's done that before, right? That's mm -hmm. the on paper, the best suited one. I would have to say that that's probably actually the least important criteria on how to make sure that you have the right person on board, weirdly. Um, that being said, not so much, the project type is not so much a criteria, I think. The, maybe the style is more because if you want a traditional home, someone who does modern work won't be able to give you that or might be able to give you that, but uh, probably it's won't just, be the it's best. It's weird. It's weird. You know, they're kind of going against their philosophy yeah. in many ways. Um, the project type question is interesting because you know, let's say you're looking at hiring this architect who's done condo remodel, but you want someone to do a house remodel of two-story single family home. Well, it's different, right? Like an apartment is not the same thing as a, a house on a lot, mm -hmm. but that person can very well do a great job at remodeling your home. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a deal breaker if they have not done exactly that type of project, because at the end of the day, any project, if it's a commercial, you know, renovation, an, a, an apartment, a home, an office, it's all about problem solving. Mm -hmm. And if the person you're hiring is talented and creative enough, it doesn't really matter what program goes into the box, right? Like that's that's just that's what they're trained to do. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting because uh, maybe the average client doesn't realize this, but architects are are educated and trained to design a lot of different types of structures. Right. All the ones you mentioned, everyone designs a library at some point in their life, if, if, if the paper, even if it's a paper project. Um, and some of the most incredible works of architecture are done by uh, an architect who had never created that type of building before, had never designed that building before. And I think what makes an architect or designer special and a good one to hire and to work with is in fact their ability to do different types of things to a degree. I think, of course it, I think it keeps them on their toes. And I think also each of these projects uh, and their differences inform the next one. Yeah. You know, if you just do the same thing over and over, at some point you just stop researching and creating. You're just repeating what you've done before. And for some people it might be totally fine, but if you're, some, if you're looking for something that's unique and that's why you're hiring a designer for, it's to design and create for you, I think you're missing the point. Yeah. hiring that that professional what well, does go back maybe to the very first question which is why are you hiring someone right yeah, yeah. if you're hiring someone for the i would say the correct purposes to create something for you as you said then yeah the the proven experience of oh okay i've done 
30 houses that were just exactly identical, then that's, um, that's not the right person for you at all. And repetition from a creator's perspective, that's, that's the biggest trap of them all between project to project is being repetitive and being mundane. But I think also for some clients, you know, they think that if they hire the person who only does that type of project, mm -hmm. there's security, there's their security, but also it's more efficient because sure. they know what they're doing. They've done it before. It doesn't mean that it's going to be more efficient. Well, it doesn't you know? mean it's going to be good. Yeah. And I think there's this, not to get, get too off track, but there's this um, over concern and uh, misunderstanding people have with efficiency and design as separate things. Design by nature is not efficient. The process of design is extremely inefficient because it requires, uh, it requires um, iterations, explorations, experimentations, and trials and errors. That's the process over and over and over again. And then the architect or designer will present maybe a couple to the client and then you do it again and then you do it again. So uh, I think efficiency and knowledge is important for technical experience, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. But if we're talking about design, uh, it's it's not as, is, as in line as, as people might think. There is no magic recipe. There is no, no step one, two, and three, and you're, you're led to a good result. It doesn't work that way. I think you're totally right. The efficiency doesn't come in the design phase. It comes in like the production phase, right? Or like the just running the business phase and being organized, which has nothing to do with being creative. Yeah. It also has to do with what you said, the problem solving and the creative thinking, which is really what you want to know when you ask the question about experience. So people might be listening to thinking, okay, you're, you're saying if I ask about experience in terms of project type, that's maybe not so useful for X, Y, and Z reasons. Well, then what should I ask in terms of experience? And the answer is you want to find out basically uh, whether or not they have architectural experience so they have an architectural education they studied architecture and they actually practiced architecture doing architecture in an architecture office <laughs> so to know whether or not um, they have that problem solving thinking uh, capabilities to do whatever project type you have and the reason why i say all that is that it is in comparison to and different from someone who does not have that experience but zoom for today they are also designing houses um, even more specifically, we, we've seen very often from clients who call us midway through a project, they hire someone who they think is an experienced licensed architect with the background that I mentioned. They assume they have that experience and background, but in fact, uh, after they get partway through and they're unhappy, they realize, oh, this person never studied architecture. They didn't actually practice at an architecture office. They studied something else, some other random degree, and they practice at an inter-design office doing mostly furnishing and decor and now they're, they evolved to designing houses because obviously it's easy to imagine that, okay, I did this and someone asked me to do interior remodel, then a home remodel, then new home. Now I can do new homes. Yes, I design new homes, right? And it's not to say that um, that individual, uh, every now and then you'll find someone who's really good at designing homes and they're a good architect. Right. I have to say from what we've seen, it's not common, right? So uh, none of these, these tips are surefire, but I think w one way to have a much, uh, to, to better guarantee a greater chance of success with the project is to make sure that the architect you're working with actually has a background in architecture because that education and experience working at a, at a practice who does that, that is the baseline. That's the foundation for all people who are designing like, act, like buildings, full yeah, buildings. Yeah. And they're different. It's a different uh, way of thinking. It's a different way of thinking. And, you know, I think anyone that's smart could problem solve things, right? Any contractor that's smart can resolve like a kitchen remodel. Any interior designer that's smart can resolve a bathroom remodel or, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a floor plan, right? Um, you know, finding uh, the solution to a problem, problem solving, it, it is one skill. Being able to design from zero and create something magical is a different one. Mm -hmm. Being able to have both work together seamlessly to create an, a stunning piece of architecture is another level, right? So yeah, it, it, I think I think people just have to kind of like be aware what is out there and and the options that are available before actually committing to any of them. Well, you kind of bring up a good point. So let's say there's three professionals that you, you that are always sort of. Um, 
sort of competing with each other in terms of uh, who's going to design the house for me. Right. There's the architect, there's the interior designer who then becomes home designer, and there's a contractor who also becomes home designer, right? And I think you start to highlight that there's a difference between the three. Like the contractors, most often uh, when they design homes, design in quotes, they approach it from the pragmatic and technical problem solving mm -hmm. uh, perspective, yeah. and they will solve certain problems for you, but mostly from a functional standpoint. And also, they tend to be hyper specific things. Like they solve this corner, this one room, but they don't think about the big picture because they aren't trained to do that. Um, so that's from one end of the spectrum. And then you have the inter design background people who approach the project from the other end of the spectrum. And it tends to be that they're much more about just the visuals, uh, dare I say, the superficial aspects, like the materiality, the colors, the textures, and you know, cool furniture and, and whatever else. The pretty picture. The pretty picture. And maybe, yeah, sometimes like the, the layout of the kitchen and things like that. But they... So you have these two people that are coming from different ends of the spectrum, but they're not quite hitting the center mark. The person who has the architectural education and background and practice and has practice at architecture offices, they are in the center mark. And that's what you want from your professional. They, you want them to have that big picture view um, and the problem solving thinking in that wide perspective, which 99% uh, of the time only comes from people who have that very specific experience and background. Yeah. So that's the experience question I would ask. It's like, did you study architecture? Did you practice at architecture offices doing architecture? And if it's a no, then, you know, it's a, a little more cause for uh, pause or hesitation, I think. Yeah, 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 for sure. The second question I think that's good to ask the professional you're about to hire is what what in the project that you want to be doing are they going to be are they going to be in charge of mm. like what what part of the house are they going to be designing right yeah the physical stuff of the project are they only going to be looking at at the volume do you know the massing the volume and the exterior facades mm -hmm. are they going to look at the master planning meaning like where does the site and and what does the house goes on the site and how you get there mm -hmm. are they going to look at what's happening inside the house are they completely going to ignore that yeah uh, this is a great question because this is another it's another point that we uh, hear from clients often when they get part way through and they realize, oh, I thought my architect was going to design this for me and, and they're not doing it. Or I didn't know they were going to do that for me. Um, and and it, unfortunately, it's confusing because different architects are comfortable and they provide a service to incorporate certain scopes, physical scopes of the projects. Sometimes it's the whole thing, in the case of us. Other times it's a piece and the people don't know. Yeah. There is a lot of assumption, and when, I feel like when you hire someone, you shouldn't assume things. You should yeah. know what you hire them for. Because uh, homes uh, and buildings, uh, for sure, but homes even, are very complicated. There's a lot of different pieces, and not everybody is going to want to be in charge of designing or selecting all the pieces. It doesn't work that way. So what are the common kind of different physical parts of a project that may or may not be in, in, one, in an architect's scope? As you said, there's a site plan. Most architects will do the site planning, but maybe some there are not. There's certainly, I think most people think architects do the exterior stuff and the massing and the Only. floor plan and that's it. Yeah. And there's like, they do the roof and then the facade and the windows. Um, I mean, the landscaping gets tricky, but usually where the line is drawn is the architect will do the site plan, but the actual specifications of the plans themselves, the architect does not do. You have a landscape designer or a landscape architect to do that. And that can vary too. Like the landscape architect could also be the one designing a yard or kitchen. Like it really depends mm -hmm. what the architects, the client and the landscape architect want to provide. And on the interiors, again, that's where it gets really fuzzy. So... Um, a fair amount of architects will want to select and specify the materials of the walls, the finishes of the walls, and they will also design, at the very least, in the floor plan view, the layouts of the entire floor plan, including the kitchen and the bathrooms, You know where all the fixtures and faucets and tubs and showers and sinks and all where all that stuff goes, right? And they may also want to do that in elevation, the side view, the layout of the cabinetry. Um, now, the will the art will your architect um, specify the materials of the countertop, specify the materials and finishes of the cabinets, the type of wood, the species, the cut, the stain, uh, and and all that stuff. 
the faucets, the, the faucets, lighting. the lighting, the integrated lighting, the decorative lighting, like chandeliers and pendants, the wood flooring, all of those things, uh, you should ask because it varies. Um, it tends to be that the really high-end architecture offices who do residential work, they want to do everything. Because for them, it's not just a project. It is a project. It's a capital P creative artistic project that they're going to invest two to five years in, and they want it to be beautiful. They want it to be within their vision for the client, and they want that authorship. That makes sense. Other offices, though, um, won't won't want to touch that stuff it also depends on on the budget like you said and kind of like the tier of projects you know let's say like lower lower level projects lower budget ones mm -hmm. like the clients might be like you know what i'm just gonna save on costs and i'm gonna select all of that stuff myself mm -hmm. that's fine uh i think you just have to make it clear at the beginning that you're not hiring them for that and yeah. if you don't want to be the one doing that you got to make sure that you are hiring them for that yeah because that's otherwise you're gonna End up at some point in the project where, well, guess what? Uh, somebody now needs to pick up the tile for the bathroom and like which shower head do you want? And you're the client and your architect's like, I, I don't do that. Then you have to like, in the middle of construction, you know, go and find someone to help you figure that out. Yeah. Um, so again, I think knowing exactly what you hire people for, how much you're paying them, but also like w what that goes toward to, yeah. you know? Specifically, and I know it's exhausting to ask these questions at the beginning of a project because you just you just want to start. I, I people are excited. I want to just start, start, start. But you, you've got to know these things because if you don't, it'll cause problems later on down the line. And I I would get super specific. I mean, like so if you were to people were to ask us what what is it that we like to be in charge of? What would we expect uh, an architect to do? I expect them to do everything, to do everything that's that's fixed to the house. They should be in charge of all of that stuff. The, the line that's most commonly drawn, or I would be okay with drawing between the architect scope, which is not, is all the loose items, the furnishing and decor items, the chairs, the, the loose, the tables that just sit on the floor and built in, the rugs, all of those things. But the rest should be figured out. I mean, even down to the lighting switches, where they're located, whether or not they're dimmable, not dimmable, what kind of lighting is being used, the color temperature of the light bulbs that are recessed inside. Um, you know, uh, the outlets, where the outlets are going, the cover plates, what kind of cover plates, how high they are, all of these things, right? The millwork, uh, whether or not there's an outlet in the millwork, all that stuff should be part of it. And it, it yeah, so you should ask your architect at the beginning. I think also sometimes um, it seems to me that clients don't want to, when they're about to onboard someone, they don't want to look ignorant. Because there is always this relationship mm -hmm. when you're about to hire someone, you don't want to show them that you know less than what they might think you do, mm -hmm. right? Because otherwise, like, maybe they can take advantage of you or they just think less of you or whatever reason is out there. But I do find that oftentimes clients shy away from asking very basic questions because they're afraid of how they're going to be perce perceived from the other yeah. side. But I think... <laughs> When you're about to make that decision, like you got to know, like there is no shame in asking basic questions and nobody's expecting you to know all of those things. And again, there is a million ways to go about it depending on who you're hiring. So you just, you just got to clarify you that. You brought up a good point of, of like how much architect costs. And I think this is important um, to avoid issues, but also if you're comparing, you know, architect A versus architect B, and they both cost the same, or one's a little more cheap, the more cost effective than the other, but the one who's more cost effective does half the things. Yeah. Like, you gotta know that, right? Yeah. And it's also not to say that if you're gonna approach an office and they would prefer to do all the things I mentioned, and you're like, whoa, that's a little bit much for me, can we dial it back a little bit? I don't think I need you to do all of those things. Can you do a little bit less? The answer a lot of times, well, yeah, we can dial yeah. it back, because every project is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, Although when it comes time for selecting faucets, your your prob client's probably going to be like, you know what, I need help. Could you take you know, care it, of it's, it's easier for an office to do it a little bit less than asking an office to do it a little bit more. If the little bit more, they've never done it before. Yeah, that's a great point. So, the third question I would ask is about the architect's process. So, process both in terms of just the overall. What are the big seven or eight phases we're going to go through from the very beginning of design all the way through the end of construction? Like give me an overview of what are the things that are going to happen because there are professional uh, industry-wide standard phases that you should go through. Um, so that's one thing. 
I think also getting a little more detailed um, and asking what is it you're going to do during each of these phases is a good thing. Like what kind of ex expect to happen when we're going through concept design and then schematic and then design development right. and then uh, CD, construction documentation, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why it's important to ask what's going to take place, let's say during the design phases, the biggest thing is like how many iterations am I going to see, right? The other phase that's really important to discuss and what's going to happen during it and what the architect's going to do during that phase is the construction phase. Yes. And, you know, we, we've seen it before where, for example, people do not know what construction administration is. Mm -hmm. And they're not expected to because, again, it's not, it's a new, it's it's a not their field. It's, it's yeah. a term that's part of the field. And if you've never done a project before, how would you know, right? But it's a very important service because it is basically when the architect just keeps an eye on the construction throughout to make sure things are going according to plans, mm -hmm. right? According to all of the things that were agreed with the client throughout all the meetings that, you know, they had to get to construction. So if you find out that when construction starts, your architect is not going to be there during construction, then, you know, that's, yeah. that's a big deal. That's a big deal for you to know yeah. because that means that you're going to be on your own with the contractor when that happens. Yeah. Um, and not everybody has time or is comfortable being in that position. So, and the re and the reason why um, it's more common now for architects to not be involved in during construction. There's two things. There's this misconception amongst uh, clients that it's not uh, helpful or not worthwhile, which is always not the case. If you talk to any good contractor, they're going to say, "Do not go through construction without your architects." The contractor will actually be the one to tell you, "No, I want yeah. your architect to be involved." And the second is that, some insider information, construction administration is typically the phase where architects lose money. <laughs> yeah, of course. So there, there's definitely a, a, a healthy number of architects who are like, you know what, I'm not going to bother with that because I can make all my money in the beginning and then leave the, the part where if things go awry and things get hairy and complicated. I'm just going to not worry about that part, which is a disservice to clients for sure. But architects do that because, again, that's the part where you lose money. So very simple. Ask for a quick description of all the phases and say, okay, during phase one, what do you do? Phase two, what do you do? And all the way through until the very, very end. Uh, so you know exactly. That way also you can, you can compare architects. Well, there. and I think also, you know, client might think like, well, I hire them to design the thing. And once the thing is designed, meaning I have all the drawings, like, why would I need them, need, need them for, you know, like I, I got what I need. It goes back to, again to taking a step back and realizing as a client, this process is going to take two to three to four years for a house, right? Um, I, I want to know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's not a quick transaction. It's, I mean, it's like you go for in for surgery. Yeah. Well, you kind of want to know like, okay, how many days in advance do I need to prep? What's happening the day of, the day after? How long is it going to last? Mm -hmm. You know, how am I going to recover? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a big commitment to start a project, whatever size or scale. It is a commitment, and you kind of want to go in with an idea of, <laughs> yeah. you know, the basic steps. You don't have to get into like the super detailed ones, but at least have an overview of the process. I think it makes sense. The fourth question I would ask is, what are the deliverables the architect will provide to you? Yeah. And this is a big one. This <laughs> yeah. is a big one. Again, I, I just keep thinking about all of the people who reach out for help, you know, on their projects. And this is also a very basic one. It's basically another, what am I paying for, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what am I getting? Um, the deliverables are super important. Are you getting hand sketches? Are you getting computerized models and realistic renderings? Are you getting construction documents? Or are you just getting like, you know, very schematic drawings yeah. like those are there's huge gaps between all of them you know like we we had a, a client who reached out one day and uh, they never seen any like 3d of their their home and then their home started to get built and they're like well we just realized this doesn't work for us yeah and and you know it makes me kind of angry to architects who do yeah. not provide that because i'm like how did you get that far without showing your client what things we're going to look like you know yeah. like there's a level of trust that has to take place between the client and their professional like you have to trust them to yeah, do yeah. their job but but that doesn't mean you keep them in the dark for what it's going to look like and what it's going to feel like um 
I think it's crazy. I mean, I, so the deliverables that you would ask about during the design phases. So generally, so there's design, construction, documentation, and then there's construction broadly. Right. There's multiple phases with the design. But um, in design, I would ask, uh, I assume you're going to see floor plans. <laughs> but I'm going to get floor plans. Are they going to be, how are they going to be executed? Are they going to be drawn to scale like accurately? Some people don't draw very accurately, amazingly. Am I going to see 3D images? Am I going to see elevations? Am I going to see material samples? Like these are some of the basics, right? And there might be some other things too, but those are the fundamentals. Um, and then even more detailed, the 3D images. I'm going to see like what quality are they? You know, are they hand water sketches, watercolor sketches, which are abstract, or are they a little closer to reality? And those are very important questions because it's it's for, it's to make sure that you understand what you're going to get before you get it. Of course. Right? But also it's to make sure that you understand the project. Some people cannot read plans. Like I've seen clients who they just do not understand it. They can't picture it. They can't put it in 3D. They can't imagine themselves walking through the rooms. And, and it I, makes sense. And it takes fine. practice to you know, understand It takes plan. a lot of work to do that. So maybe these people need 3D or like even just basic 3D. It doesn't need to be like super realistic mm -hmm. renderings. I think there is also like a like a, a false expectation of everyone wanting like realistic renderings when yeah. it, honestly you don't need that like half of the time, right? Yeah. So yeah, deliverables are super important. It's a legitimate question to ask. There is no shame in asking exactly the types of documents you're gonna get. You need to know. It, it also, it's it's not just deliverables for the client's sake. I mean, it is obviously, but. It's also for the architect's sake. Like, I just can't imagine any... Okay, for okay. All of the architects we admire and we look up to and fellow colleagues, the same age of us who we also admire greatly, everyone produces the stuff that I mentioned. No one is working just in plan and not doing ele not doing 3D. Yeah. Um, and certainly, I mean, elevations are primary but some people don't even do elevations they just do a floor plan and then the contractor just goes and that's like that's that's not what's supposed to happen so the baseline for me is all the stuff i mentioned this should be happening i it, it i i quite i cannot imagine working through a project and not looking at it in 3d these days with the tools we all have there's no reason for it and for the client's uh, own sake but also for the architects like i want to see what this thing looks yeah. like so i can make the design better because you always catch something in 3d or in plan or in section or in elevation or in detail that you didn't see in the other views yeah yeah well and i think also for the client um you need to know what things are going to look like before it gets built it's always a bad idea and a huge risk to just go in with construction with like a basic plan and figure it all out as you go. It's gonna take you a lot more time. It's yeah. gonna cost you a lot more money. It's gonna make some things irreversible. Like you won't be able to go backwards because it's it's too late. It's built. You know. Unless you want to spend a lot more. Unless money. you want to like tear it down and spend more. So, well, this, it, it's so part of like the project planning. You know. Yeah. Like it's super important. Well, the last point about construction gets also to construction documents. Now, construction documents are much more difficult to to understand or to know whether or not the construction documents that architect is going to produce is of high quality or not because how would you know that as a client right so i don't really have an answer to that i guess i suppose you could ask to see their cds and ask for a fellow professional and say like are these good quality construction documents but it is to say at the very least that we have seen um a lot of different types of construction documents produced by many different types of architects and there is a range of quality I... they're not all created equal <laughs> and for sure um, the construction documents that are of high quality do make a big difference. It's not just gold plating. It's not just, oh, they're spending time drawing a bunch of stuff. It does make a difference. It does make things more efficient and more cost effective in the end. I think a good contractor would be able to tell you if those construction documents are good ones or not. Because it's basically the drawings that they need to build. So if it's not clear or it's lacking information or detail, like they're the first one to know because that's the information they don't see on the drawings. Yes, yeah, totally. Know? So deliverables, ask what you're going to see throughout the project, what they're going to give you. The fifth and final um, point of this recording is the contract. The, the actual the architect's contract that they're going to give you, you're going to sign, that they're going to sign, and that's what you're going to use to move forward uh, from. Um, there is a tendency for everyone who's hiring a professional 
to want to see a contract that's really short because it's easier to read, it's digestible, and you feel more secure because you feel like because it's short, there's trust and there's less traps hidden within the contract. You right. see a really long contract, you, your first thought is like, what are they trying to hide in here? And what is, what's gonna happen that's gonna make this uh, be necessary? When you see a small contract, you think, oh, this is easy, let's, let's go, it's, this is gonna be pie. Short contracts are a red flag to me. <laughs> because if that? because if you spend 10 minutes writing that one page contract, it tells me you didn't put much effort or thoughts into it. You're not probably very thorough and you're probably not very committed to it. Like you're not putting you're not putting your responsibility in it and you're not asking the client to put his responsibility in it. Mm -hmm. Like there is no it's kind of like, oh, it's easy. Let's just go and, you know, see how it goes. And you don't want that. You no. don't want to see how it goes. You don't want to have to figure it out when issue happens. Like, now what do we do? There's nothing in the contract. So, yep. you know, how are we supposed to resolve this? I think it, it's much more forward and and honest to lay it all out clearly on paper and be like, if any of these things happen, this is how we're going to go about it. And we both agree that's how we're going to go about it. Because otherwise, <laughs> you know, like... Yeah. I mean, if you take, again, a step back and you think about what's going to take place, we're talking about a multi-year project. There are, let's say, seven to eight different phases, which I've mentioned before. Each phase is a little bit or sometimes radically different from the next, which means the work that takes place during that phase for the architect is different. The things they're going to show you are different. The uh, number of professionals involved uh, is different. And by the end, you have dozens, maybe hundreds of different professionals that touch the project over the course of, let's say, three and a half years, right? The contract should should cover each of those phases and all the bits that can happen during it, right? And so the idea that you would have that long process, that, compl that complicated process with all different people and stuff, oh, here's a half-page contract, we'll be okay. There's no way. There's no way. Um, the, of course, there's the AIA, the American Institute of Architects. They have their version of the contract. I don't want to say most, because a fair amount of architects use that as a basis, and they'll quote it within their contract, saying like they're referring to that one in a way. A bit of, again, inside information. It's not the best contract. So a lot of, uh, most of the architects we know who, again, operate at the kind of higher end tier and do complicated really complicated houses, they have their own contract or they modify the AIA one. But so people might be asking, so what, what was like a contract length I should expect? It varies a lot. So I'm kind of hesitant to give out page numbers, but from what we've seen, it'd be like eight to 11 pages is about the range you would see for oh, a I complicated mean, Depending on house. the firm that you hire, if you're hiring like for a house. big established firms, the contracts would be even longer than that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And obviously if you're doing like towers and that's a totally different beast <laughs> completely, but we're talking about houses, but complicated or, or nice houses, eight to eight to 11, but that's very different. Eight to 11 is very different from like, oh, I expect it to be like two pages. Like, there's no way we can fit in well, two pages. And I mean, there also depends on the scope of work. Sure. If you're, you know, just changing the tide in the bathroom and that's all you do, one page might be fine. Yeah, right? yeah, sure, sure. If you're gut renovating a house and the only thing that's left is like the exterior studs, ah, oh, maybe it's gonna be a bit longer than that, you know. It's true. If you're building a new home on a on a hill in LA, well, it's gonna be even more than that, you know. Like it's it's kind of like project dependent and and, um, and scope dependent. Yeah, scope dependent. I mean, it, it's this reminds me also sometimes when we get bids from contractors and clients get bids from contractors, they see the lowest bid and think, okay, this makes the most sense. This guy's way too high. But as we said before, sometimes the other person's high because they actually did their homework and they've calculated more realistically how much it's going to cost. And they've, they have, they're offering more yeah. and it's more realistic. The same thing with the architect and the architect's contract. Like for example, um, some of the services or phases or scopes that we mentioned that might not be in the contract are like construction administration. Well, if the architect doesn't, doesn't offer construction administration, that's a red flag. And if they're not including it in their contract, well, that removes like, I don't know, a page or half a page or whatever it is. Um, another aspect, which is not so common for architecture, maybe it is, but is specification. So selection of all the finished materials, the faucets, all the built-in stuff. Even further than that, um, selection and procurement and ordering of, um, of loose items like furniture, right? 
and that's a whole nother that's like two pages of potentially of 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 agreement so i would advise people the way that we like to think about contracts and i, I is that the contract should really be in a way an overview of what's going to happen in the process and it should talk about the process because that's how the contracts work they talk it's phase by phase by phase and all the details of who's going to talk to who what happens if this takes place and who's responsible for this and that that's what a good contract should be um so if i were a client uh if you're a client i would say like don't don't be turned off by an eight page contract in comparison to a one page i would actually flip it in my mind yeah um for sure yeah me too i think yeah. i would rather know no more than i like, just keep it super vague and then like something happens and i have no idea what's supposed to be how it's supposed to be handled and i, I as a bonus question i would ask the, your, your your contract ask your architect to talk through the contract with you because yeah. contracts are always hard to read the, the, this legal terms and, and also architectural terms professional terms that the client might not know be like you talk me through the contract what does all this mean exactly yeah. and uh it should all be able to be uh revoiced in normal everyday language in a way that makes sense and follows with the project be like you know we're responsible for these things but we're not responsible for that the contractor does that oh okay that makes sense that's what this whole <laughs> paragraph means you know I mean, you know, it's like, I'm just thinking about like medical things, but like, it's like you go, you go in before a procedure, they make you sign 15 forms, right? Like you have to read it, they explain things to you, you have to understand that's what you're embarking on, yeah. right? And if you don't agree with it, well, you don't sign it or you ask it to change, but it's, I think it's better to just putting everything on the table and talk about it than like not. Agreed. All right, so now you know everything you need to do <laughs> to find the right architect. Why don't we give ourselves um, in the audience a quick summary of the five tips or questions? Sure. Number one is experience. Ask your professional what kind of experience they have, not just project experience, but they're also but also their professional experience and what kind of education they have in their background. Number two is what scope of work, like physical scope of work, are they going to be in charge mm. of? Are they going to do site planning, only exterior elevation? Are they going to design the interior? Are they even going to select the furnishing for you? Like, what are they going to provide you with? And number three is process. Get an overview. Have them describe the overall process and the different phases you're going to go through. And also ask them what services are they going to provide and what do they do during each of the phases, especially construction. Number four is the deliverables. What can you expect to see? Are you going to see hand sketches, 3D models, mm -hmm. detailed plan, construction details, uh, material, material samples? Yep. You know, like what, what can you expect? And number five is the contract. Obviously, you're going to see their contract, but uh, I think a longer contracts can actually be to your benefit. Uh, because they're more thorough and more accurate with what the process is going to require. And ask them to talk through the contract with you if you're confused. Even if you're not confused, have them talk it through it with you. All right, sounds good. If you're listening to this episode and you're about to hire someone, let us know how this worked out. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, these are the questions that always come up, again, based on what we hear from clients who are in trouble. So I think this will be helpful. Right? Yeah, so if somehow, you know, this could help people not get into those bad situations, uh, that would be awesome. And if you have questions, in addition to these, uh, then reach out to us. You can find us, uh, the podcast has a website, of course, which is secondstudiopod.com. There's an email address, which is hello at secondstudiopod.com. You can email us there. You can also find us on Instagram, uh, DM us on there. You can also text the hotline. We have a phone number for the show, which is 213 Two 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 six nine five zero. You can text or leave a voicemail, and we will get back get back to you that way. And if you're in trouble and you're looking for a good architect, you can also find us on famearchitects.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We're Why available not? anywhere for for yeah. answers and questions and for help. You can find the podcast on most of the podcast platforms. We're also on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, <laughs> anywhere you can think of. We're probably there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you don't find us, we will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find you <laughs> okay thanks everybody for listening I hope you found this helpful any questions reach out and we'll talk soon thanks bye bye bye